people like me. You need people like me so you can point your fing fingers and say that's the bad guy. Okay, we'll start with this. The word round the campfire seems to be it's official. According to a well-informed source, unbeaten Mary Spencer of Canada will face former champion Femke Hermans December 16th at Shawinigan. Is that how you say that? So I said it. A good step up for Spencer, who can continue to show her talent in preparation for a world championship. Given how quickly Mary dispatched... Didn't take her no time at all to knock out Cynthia Lozano. She didn't get to bank very many, if any, rounds in that fight, so it's only right that they wheel her back out one more time before this year is out so she can continue to amass professional experience ahead of what is to be her eventual world title shot, her world title opportunity, because... Being honest with you, I can't think of anyone that stands in Mary Spencer's way. She quite literally, at least to me, is the most dangerous woman at 154 pounds. She's a threat to the challengers, the contenders, and the champions. She's got the size, skill, speed, pedigree, and punching power. There are three champions remaining in today's junior middleweight division. Two of them are set to lock horns before this year's out. Natasha Jonas, unified junior middleweight champion Natasha Jonas, and Marie Eve DK care of Canada. The third world champion at this weight, newly crowned WBA junior middleweight champion Terry Harpier is on holiday. They may not realize it, but they're working on the clock and they need to work fast to do a fight between them beyond this year's unification match. Mary's coming. They ain't got all the time in the world to sort it out. They don't still want to be there when Mary Spencer comes a knocking. For now, she's going to be opposite the ring, former champion Femke Hermans, who has shared the ring with the likes of Alicia Napoleon, Claricia Shields, more recently, Sylvania Marshall, the first woman to ever stop Belgium's own Femke Hermans. Femke, who has since rebounded off that knockout loss. Femke, who sports a professional record of 13 wins with four losses, no draws with five knockouts, having only ever been stopped once. Just once. She's coming off a unanimous decision win over veteran journeywoman career opponent Bohana Libizuska. She got stopped by Savannah in April, rebounded off the loss, bounced back in June. Certainly a more solid opponent than Cynthia Lozano, who I told you she wasn't going to last in there with Mary. Perhaps Femke, the former champion, can give her a little bit more resistance, maybe last a little longer, though I wouldn't be surprised. If Mary stops Femke in similar fashion to what Savannah did. Now Savannah stopped Femke Hermans up there at middleweight. This will be a junior middleweight contest. Mary's fought five times this year, and she's only getting better. She's only getting more dangerous. Inching closer towards an inexorable world title shot, a world title opportunity. It's just a question of which one it's going to be. Is it going to be the WBC? Is it going to be the WBA? The IBF? Because Mary Spencer, she's got a well-to-do promotional outfit behind her, and they're keeping her busy. They're keeping her active. I think that Femke Hermans, given her experiences, she can at least last longer than Chris Namas did, than... Cynthia Lozano, I think this one might go more than just one round. Just one round. But like I said before, I wouldn't be at all surprised to see Mary stop Femke the same way Savannah did. For some of the same reasons that Savannah stopped Femke, because she's a statuesque, physically imposing fighter with real punching power, real stopping power, and skill. Emphasis on skill, because you can have all the punch and power in the world. It don't mean nothing if you can't land, if you can't set up your shots properly. Mary can. Mary Spencer was a special amateur. She's a special fighter here today, and she has everything it takes to rock today's junior middleweight division to its core. Mary Elizabeth Spencer! Spencer! Spencer. Mary's reckoning!
everybody in the junior middleweight division. The challenges, the champions, they have to batten down the hatches because I don't see nobody, nobody out there that can handle Mary Spencer's size or movement or speed or skill and her punching power. I don't see nobody. Yeah, yeah Femke Hamans is a former champion and she's experienced and she's five years younger than Mary. But I don't think any of that is going to matter once both women are in the ring. I think Mary likely stops Femke the same way she just stopped Cynthia Lozano and Chris Namis before her. Mary Spencer Spencer to win is the pick. In whatever fashion she sees fit. Because beyond that, she's got bigger fish to fry. In other news, the continued fallout of the Connor Ben versus Chris Eubank Jr. collapse, Connor's positive test, resident ped cheat Jarrell Miller on Eddie Hearn's handling of Connor Ben's positive drug test. Eddie Hearn's really trying to dismiss it like it's nothing when it's his fighters. When it's other fighters, he's quick to say something about it. We all know. Eddie is a hypocrite. And you know what? Jarrell's on to something. He is. He's not wrong. He's right. Eddie Hearn is a hypocrite. But then again, so is Jarrell Miller. And most, if not all, of the boxing world on both sides of the industry. That's why nobody can sit on a high horse and wag their finger at Eddie over this when they're just as complicit. Jarrell Miller, least of all. He can't seriously sit on a high horse wag his finger at Eddie Hearn over how big a hypocrite Eddie is when he's a pretty big hypocrite himself. Wasn't it Jarrell Miller that was accusing Anthony Joshua of using banned substances only for him to be the one that fails two VADA tests, not even including the test that he failed, the anti-doping test that he failed back when he was a kickboxer. Jarrell Miller is a notorious ped cheat. And he knows what he's doing. He's always known. He knows what he's doing, he knows what he is, but he still tried to slander the next guy for what he himself is doing. If you know you're on performance enhancing drugs, then what good is it accusing the next guy of doing that? What are you trying to achieve? Hey, let's say Anthony is on performance enhancing drugs, not saying that he is, he's never failed a VADA test, but let's just, let's play devil's advocate. For argument's sake, let's say that everything Jarrell Miller accused Anthony Joshua of, let's just say that all of that is true. What difference does it make to you? Why should his pets bother you? You're on them too. Aren't you two playing the same game? If we go with your logic. That is, if we go with Jarrell Miller's accusations that he levied against Anthony Joshua, the most that means is that the both of you are playing the same game, and that's about it. So why are what you... What are you dry snitching on that guy for? This is the problem that the entire industry the entire sport faces no one, not the fighters, not their managers, not their promoters, not even the fight fans themselves. No one can sit on a high horse wagging their finger in anyone's face when it comes to doping in the sport of boxing when most everyone in boxing is complicit. Every single fighter that pisses hot has a lofty explanation for how it happened. It's always the same thing. It's the same song and dance. The fight fans themselves are hypocrites. They pick and choose when they want doping in the sport to matter so long as it doesn't pertain to their own favorite fighter. Whether you're talking about Canelo Alvarez or Tyson Fury. Hypocrites. Hypocrites as far as the eye can see. So spare me the Eddie Hearn is a hypocrite bit, okay? Eddie Hearn is one hypocrite among several hypocrites. You among them. One among many. Let he who is without double standards cast the first stone. My views on doping in the sport of boxing have changed over the years because when you take a step back and look at the picture, the whole picture, what you realize is this has been going on for a very long time. The sport is rife with it. Moreover, the sport is okay with it. And what we're seeing now in reference to Conor Ben, his positive test, it has less to do with Conor, less to do with doping in the sport, and more to do with people attempting to weaponize this issue and make it about Eddie Hearn. Even weirder is that Callie Sorland, Chris Eubank Jr.'s promoter, he was okay with moving forward with the event in spite of the positive test. So is Chris Eubank Jr. Nobody seems to have an axe to grind Callie Sarland, nobody's all their moral authority. I heard Simon Jordan of Talk Sport laying into Eddie Hearn, calling him a coward, saying he's avoiding the tough questions. Hey, Simon, you want to ask a tough question? Here's a tough question. Why was Callie Sarland okay with moving forward with this event? Even though he knew Connor tested positive for a banned substance, why isn't anybody laying into Callie Sarland? Well, that's easy. These people don't have an axe to grind with Callie Sorlin. They're making this an Eddie Hearn issue. These people don't give two furry flamingo-shaped fucks about doping in the sport of boxing. They're fully aware of it. Hell, some of them... Some of their favorite fighters have failed anti-doping tests. They don't spend as much time on that as they're spending on this. In case you're not aware, Simon Jordan, who's laying into Eddie Hearn, he's a big 
Tyson Fury fan. How much do you really care about doping in the sport of boxing when you're high on an Androlone user? A guy who got busted years ago. Yeah, yeah. Eddie Hearn's a hypocrite. a hypocrite. So Simon, Simon Jordan, Jordan, so's, so's Jarrell Miller. Miller. Take a number. In other news, Alan Babich has been ordered to fight for the European heavyweight title. Alan Babich could fight for European strap, but world title negotiations are also ongoing. Alan Babich is a limited fighter I have no illusions about, but he's made for TV. All action Croatian. Alan the Savage Babich, 11-0 with 10 KOs, has been ordered to face fellow unbeaten heavyweight Germany's own Peter Kadiru, 14-0 with 7 KOs for the vacant European Championship. The European heavyweight title was last contested in November of 2020 when Joe Joyce stopped Daniel Dubois in the 11th round of their behind-closed-door clash. He's been ordered by the EBU to face Peter Kadiru, though at the same time, there appear to have been negotiations between Alan Babich and the Oscar Rivas people. In the updated September 30th rankings, Alan Babich and Peter Kadiru were the number 14 and number 16 contenders, respectively. A host of fighters have turned down the opportunity to fight for the EBU title, giving the Croatian and German a chance to fight for the title. And you know what? They still might. Oscar Rivas ain't no walk in the park for a guy as limited as Alan Babic. Don't misunderstand me. I love to watch Alan Babic work. You know, he's a very entertaining guy, but a part of what makes him so entertaining is that he is limited, he is hittable, he is beatable. He's been dropped before. He's been on Quiz Street more than once in his last two fights. I think it all depends on what Alan Babic wants to do. He can fight this Kadiru guy, take a chance on him for a regional belt, or he can take a chance on Oscar for a world title. A world title belt by way of the major... By way of one of the major four alphabet organizations the WBC. Lest we forget, Oscar Rivas is the WBC's Bridger weight champion. In truth, he's the only Bridger weight champion because the WBA, the WBO, and the IBF, they don't recognize that division, at least not yet. That is an invention specific to the WBC. Babich outpointed Poland's Adam Balski, 16-1, back in May, making him the mandatory challenger for Oscar Rivas' WBC World Bridgerweight title. Rivas' promoter, Yvonne Michel of Canada, told Fight Freaks United Dan Raphael that they are in an early stage of discussions with Babich. Michel would like to make Rivas versus Alain Babich in Montreal, whilst Eddie Hearn would like to stage the fight on November 26th on the Dillian White undercard, where Bobich is slated to return. Alan Bobich is 11-0 right now. You know, it's a bit soon to fight for a world title, even a Bridgerweight title. Though at the same time, what kind of chances does this guy stand? What kind of chance does he really stand of winning a full-fledged heavyweight title? You know, if he forgoes this world title shot on the premise that he might get another one down the line, Will he get another one down the line? Can he really afford to walk away from this fight here and now? Most guys 11 and 0, they're not fighting for full-fledged titles. They're not. That's the truth. So if Alan Babich were to decide to forego the WBC title shot in favor of the EBU title shot, I'd understand. I would. It's just that given Alan's limitations as a boxer, you wonder if another opportunity like that one will ever come around. I don't think Alan stands much of a chance of seeing himself crowned a heavyweight champion. He gets to that upper echelon, those upper tier heavyweights, they'll splatter this guy. They'll have to scrape him out of the ring with a spatula. Like I said, I like watching Alan Babich in action, but I don't have any illusions about him either. He stands a better chance of winning a Bridgerweight title than a heavyweight title, and that really would be Alan's best bet at seeing himself crowned a world champion of any kind. So, you know, that's the question. Given Alan's limitations as a boxer, how many more opportunities like this one to fight for a world title, how many more are going to come around? If Alan Babich passes on this thing, Oscar Rivas will move into a fight with Lukas Rosansky, and Alan would presumably fight for that EBU title. And because Yvonne Michel wants it in Canada, and Eddie wants it in the UK, as soon as next month, Alan Babich might pass on this thing. We're in the middle of October. Eddie wants to do this thing sometime in November. Yvonne Michelle said they're in the early stages of negotiations. Early talks. You just don't get the sense they've got enough time to do this fight. Not by November, anyways. November 26th? No way. Not unless Alan Babich plans on fighting in Montreal. On an Yvonne Michelle promotion where Oscar Rivas will have home field advantage and he will be the house fighter. No, I don't think so. I don't think Alain is about to do that. I think Alain, in all likelihood, may return on November 26th alongside his buddy, 
Dillian White. Dillian White, whose potential opponent options range from Otto Valin, Jermaine Franklin, Dempsey McCain, and Chris Ariola. You know, there was a rumor a little over a week ago that Anthony Joshua had sent Chris Ariola an offer to face him in his comeback fight in December, and I didn't buy into that. I didn't believe it. Eddie Hearn very recently dispelled that rumor, and we talked about that in my previous video. He is, however, in the running for a Dillian White fight. Dillian White, who was stopped earlier this year by Tyson Fury. Dillian White has headlined his own shows for a while now, fought on pay-per-view on the Sky Sports platform. He has a following of his own, but I don't really get the sense you can sell people an Areola fight as a box office fight. Perhaps the saving grace is that maybe it won't be a box office fight. Maybe it won't be a pay-per-view. Oh, well, you know, even if it isn't, who wants to see White versus Areola? Chris Ariola's over the hill. This is intended to be a rebound fight for Dillian White to get him back in the winner's bracket, but I don't know. Chris Ariola, bit of a tough sell. Otto Valine, I think Dillian would be biting off more than he can chew, fighting someone as ambitious as Otto Valine. We saw what Otto could do when he's in. When he's switched on, he can be quite formidable. Tyson Fury knows all about that. The bloody grimace. Otto Valin gave him when they fought over a year ago. I'm not actually against Dillian White taking on Otto Valin for his comeback fight. They were supposed to fight before the Fury fight, but Dillian White reportedly pulled out injured. A lot of people didn't believe he was injured. A lot of people felt he was preserving himself for Tyson Fury, but better still, regardless of what you believe, they do have some unfinished business, and I'm not against the fight. I'm just saying. For Dillian... That's ambitious. It would be. I don't get the sense Dillian's going to fight Dempsey McKean in November because Dempsey McKean is going to be in action this weekend. He's fighting on Matchroom's Australia show with Sky Nicholson, Jock Barvis, Liam Bottle. That would be less than ideal for Dempsey McKean, who I don't know. Maybe he gets a little bit banged up in the fight, suffers a cut, anything that could impede him getting back out there as early as next month. I just don't know. And they also mentioned American heavyweight up-and-comer Jermaine Franklin. 21 wins, no losses, no draws. 14 knockouts and not tested, not battle-tested at this level. I know that Dillian White has his flaws. He has his drawbacks, but he's been a bona fide top 10 heavyweight for years now. Jermaine Franklin has never fought someone quite like this. Jermaine Franklin, who's fought a uh, one or two familiar faces in Jerry Forrest, who he won a decision against, Rydell Booker. Jermaine last saw action earlier this year in May against Rodney Moore, who he stopped by way of a technical knockout. Journeyman level guy, losses in the double digits. It's about 21 of them. A career opponent, that kind of guy, that kind of opponent. And those are, for the most part, the kind of guys that young Jermaine Franklin has been fighting. A little-known, unbeaten American heavyweight that has been flying largely under the radar, and he's not with a major promotional outfit. Jermaine Franklin is a distinct possibility and perhaps the cheapest alternative. He might be. I mean, Chris Ariola, he's been around the block. So is Otto Valine. I don't know. Maybe Dillian ends up fighting Jermaine. Maybe he fights somebody else. One of the other guys. We'll see.